energized by Britain's exit from the European Union and Donald Trump's victory in the US presidential race, populist movements are sweeping Europe. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C., and this is The Heat. Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi is the latest political leader to resign after voters rejected his constitutional reforms in this month's elections. The referendum on Italy's constitution and the presidential election in Austria are examples of the strength of anti-establishment sentiment across Europe. Voters in Austria ultimately rejected the far-right party candidate who championed against immigration and free trade. But populist parties are staging campaigns in France, Germany and the Netherlands for next year's elections. We begin with this report from CCTV's Miriam Zaidi in Brussels. Another referendum called and another surprise referendum lost. The defeat for Italy's pro-European Prime Minister Matteo Renzi was a coup for the so-called alt-right and the anti-establishment forces. On the heels of the Brexit vote in June, the UK's withdrawal from the European Union and Donald Trump's US presidential election victory last month, many are asking whether Italy will be the next domino to fall in the wave of populism. Could Italy's political drama lead to a new Eurozone crisis? We are not going to see an Italy exit in the short term, I'm sure of this. It was a referendum in favour or against Mr. Renzi. Italy, the third largest economic member of the Eurozone, is viewed as a pro-EU state, unlike the UK. For socialist MEP Claude Moraes, the situation is far too complex to point a finger at just one common denominator, populism. You're getting people through insecurity, wages not having risen in many countries, Britain is an example, um, and of course identity politics. People will suffer during this period because the solutions don't lie in demagoguery, blaming other people. But politics isn't Italy's only problem. There are real concerns over the possibility of a sovereign debt crisis. That, coupled with the momentum provided for anti-establishment groups, could see some very tricky months ahead for Italy. If uh, populist uh, parties you know, come to power, they may express a disagreement with the austerity policy of Germany. And will it lead to the break of the euro? No. But will it make our life more difficult? Certainly, yes. So is a crisis looming? If mainstream Eurocrats can deliver on a better Europe and find a message that speaks to those on the fringes, it may be kept at bay. And Miriam joins us now from Brussels. And Miriam, what are the core reasons for voter discontent in Italy? Hi, Anon. Well, the scale of the no vote was almost 60%, so that was a stinging rebuke of constitutional reform. The former Italian Prime Minister, Matteo Renzi, staked his political future on referendum, just like another former Prime Minister, the British David Cameron, did, and they both lost. This was a vote essentially by Italians against Renzi and his government. Many saw the reforms as a power grab, not as a moment for change or efficiency. But another thing to remember is that electorates, especially in Eurozone countries, those countries have had to push through punishing reforms by Brussels and still find themselves, such as Italy does, with a sluggish economy, massive public debt, uh, mushrooming banking crisis and high unemployment. They're vulnerable to the rhetoric of anti-establishment or alt-right parties who promise change but are so far untested at delivering on many of their promises. Now, how concerned is the European Union about this development and the fact that Britain's exit could perhaps sway other countries to follow that lead? Well, Italy was one of two big votes over one weekend in early December. The other, of course, was Austria. Um, that commentators predicted would lead to possibly the breakup of the EU or a Eurozone crisis. Now, Austria was a significant win for the EU. The far-right candidate was defeated, but the main part is that he did get close to winning. Now, after the Italian referendum, Europe has reacted positively. Many shot down talks of an Italexit. Um, EU politicians since the Brexit and certainly after the Ita Italy vote seem to now understand that they have to win back their voters. Some even have gone so far as to say that populist movements serve as a purpose, that they are a self-correcting tool of society. But EU general elections do take place next year. Netherlands, of course, is up first, and that's being touted once again as a defining moment for the EU 
project future. Uh, but we also need to look ahead to German and French elections. Marine Le Pen has turned her party's fortunes around in France, and there's a real chance that she can actually break through. So the next months are definitely crucial for the EU. OK, thanks. That's Miriam Zaidi reporting from Brussels. Joining us now from London is Paula Subachi. She's a research director of international economics with Chatham House. Here with us in the studio is Ansgar Grau. He's a senior political correspondent with the German newspapers Die Welt and Welt am um, Sonntag. Also with us from Salzburg via Skype is Reinhard Heinisch. He's a professor of Austrian politics and head of the political science department at the University of Salzburg. And from Berlin, we're joined by Dominic Thomas. He's the chair of French and Francophone studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Paolo, let me start with you, and let's look at the events in Italy. Prime Minister Matteo Renzi wanted to change the Italian constitution. He put it to a referendum, he lost, and then he resigned. But what was he trying to accomplish, and to what do you attribute the fact that Italians said no? Well, what he wanted to accomplish is to uh, create a more uh, so-called efficient uh, electoral system and to reconcile and to resolve the contradictions into the uh, system which uh, has uh, uh, which elects the, the lower chambers and the system which elects the upper chambers. So the two are different and therefore they tend to give uh, contradictory results or results that makes governing uh, complicated. So by reforming the upper house, Matteo Renzi thought to uh, and hoped to be able to have a more uh, efficient system and with which could give uh, a full majority to the winning uh, party. Dominic, we hear of more and more support going to what are called populist forces in Europe, in Italy as well. Uh, was the outcome of the Italian referendum a boost for these forces? I think it, it absolutely was. What we've witnessed in the last uh, six months, particularly since the, um, the Brexit vote, are some dramatic transformations in the electoral landscape um, throughout, uh, throughout Europe. Um, what we've seen is actually a kind of traditional uh, a sort of dismantling of traditional party structures and the emergence of these um, uh, populist uh, parties. Uh, we saw with the Brexit vote the way in which the UKIP um, party was able to shape that, um, that discussion around the future of the UK. Uh, we certainly saw it in the Netherlands with the uh, Green Party and the Freedom Party um, you know, finding themselves in the runoff to the presidential elections and all the elections that are coming up uh, in 2017 in Europe, predominantly in the Netherlands and, and in France, are going to be shaped by these populist parties that are, for the most part hail from the far right or the extreme right. So there's tremendous uh, amount of, um, uh, of, of sort of coalition between these, uh, these different parties and the outcomes of these votes and referenda. But Dominic, if we look at what happened in Italy, it seems to be a little bit contradictory. Here we had Matteo Renzi, who may or may not be considered an establishment politician, trying to implement change, which was rejected by the electorate. So is that contradictory, or was this, as our reporter pointed out earlier on, some kind of power grab? Well, I think it's, it's both. I think what's so fascinating is that the, both you know, the polling and also the outcomes of these elections or of these, uh, of these referenda uh, don't follow any uh, traditional path of, uh, of logic. People often are voting even against their primary interests. And if there's something that Matteo Renzi did not learn uh, um, by having this referendum was what could potentially happen, as indeed happened with the, um, uh, with the Brexit vote. These have become opportunities for these non non-establishment political parties to lobby against the establishment and their um, anti-establishment uh, platforms uh, along with their views on, uh, on Europe, on immigration and so on, are captivating the electorate, uh, often detracting from the main issues at stake, which was to reform the constitution uh, and most likely uh, would have helped Italy move in a more positive uh, direction. So the inclination, it would seem today, is to disrupt this political process. What we're left with at the end of it, though, are some serious questions about what these alternative parties actually are going to propose to the people should they actually either make it to, uh, to the political structure. Reinhard, uh, if we look at the Austrian uh, election, it pitted a far-right candidate, Norbert Hofer, against an independent former Green Party leader, Alexander van der Bellen, who was the candidate who ultimately won. But uh, despite this result, was this election and its outcome a repudiation of Austria's mainstream political parties? 
Yeah, I mean, I would certainly support that view. I mean, if if on one level it was clearly a setback for the Freedom Party, but on the other hand, actually, it strengthens or it will strengthen its hands in the uh, upcoming parliamentary elections next year. And secondly, if we consider this a defeat or a setback, <laughs> we have to redefine uh, our conception of victory because nearly one in every two Austrians have voted for the Freedom Party. But I think what we've seen in Austria, and that's a sort of response to what has been said before, is perhaps a sort of a, a negative Brexit and Trump effect that we've seen. I think had we had a much more positive reporting on the outcome of Brexit and uh, the negative reporting on the election of Donald Trump in North America, in the US, we probably would have seen a victory by the Freedom Party. But I think people are stability minded and, and are and are afraid of, and, and, and given the world that's been changing, they prefer the devil they know to the devil they don't know. So this may actually um, open open it up uh, in terms of the outcomes of the elections next year in Germany and in France. So I don't know whether there's a limit perhaps of the kind of change, the amount of change people uh, want to see. So let's go. We uh, see the outcome of the Italian referendum. We see Brexit. We see growing support for conservatives far-right groups in countries like Germany, like France, even in the Netherlands. Um, so this sweep of anti-establishment sentiment, what's driving it? I think there are different reasons and one reason is Europe is facing several crises, crises at this moment. There is a, the currency crisis. Uh, we are tending to forget this currency crisis due to this new crisis in regard to the uh, refugees, but uh, still this crisis exists with high unemployment rates, for example, especially in the uh, southern uh, countries of the European Union. And since, especially since, since 2015, we have this even more uh, pressing crisis of this uh, uh, stream of refugees. And uh, the, the people in most, in, in a lot of European countries tend to think that the establishment politicians, the so-called establishment politicians, are not able to, to deal with these new problems. And uh, the, the big question is whether uh, you can uh, um, uh, form some new parties and they will be able uh, to form uh, with these uh, problems. But I think at least uh, we have to, to admit that European leaders, also for example the German politicians, uh, made some uh, mistakes uh, when they uh, underestimated the, the, uh, the, wi the weight of this uh, new crisis. Paula, uh, in Italy, look at politics in Italy, you got the anti-establishment five-star movement, as it's known. It got a quarter of the votes in Italy's last parliamentary election, that was in 2013, and it also won, uh, won rather um, mayoral races in Turin and in Rome as well. What does that movement stand for? Well, that's a very difficult question. It's, uh, it's, it's actually a movement which uh, uh, has been established around uh, um, a, a blog that this uh, comedian, Beppe Grillo, uh, started years ago. And it uh, has a very powerful messages, but, you know, does he have a political program? No. Does he have an agenda? No. It's actually been, uh, the, 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 the movement has been to be against everything and against the established, uh, uh, established politicians. But, you know, I'd like to give a bit more of a, a, a more precise connotation about this establishment politician. In Italy, for many people, and many people who voted no, uh, politician, there is a very a strict links between political life and corruption. There is a, a great deal of corruption into the public administration, uh, despite attempt to clear up uh, this, uh, this corruption, but it's still there. There is a fundamental lack of transparency and accountability. And this is what people resent, and this is why people tend to follow these uh, anti-establishment parties, because they feel that there is a uh, at least they, this, this party somehow expressed their feeling. There isn't any positive message, there isn't a program, there isn't an agenda, but pe at least people feel then they can express their discontent. Wrongly, but that's the reality. Dominic, uh, let's look at France as another example. I mean, there's a socialist right now in the Elysee Palace, uh, but come the next presidential election, we'll have 
Francois Fillon, uh, who will be up against, uh, possibly up against uh, Marine Le Pen, the far right candidate. So that's a very sharp turn to the right in France. What happened there? It is. It is. And I think that, this, that the broader picture, in fact, is not simply an anti-establishment picture. I see an absolute move towards the right and towards far-right policies. In the last 20 years, we've essentially witnessed a, a collapse of the divisions between the traditional left and the traditional right. Uh, this means that, particularly around questions of economics, this means that many constituencies and communities, primarily working class communities, feel that they've been abandoned by the left and under assault from the right. Attacks on welfare, and those kinds, of, uh, those kinds of critiques and have become therefore very open to these kinds of populist uh, agendas. But in addition to that, because these agendas don't just appeal, and it's a mistake to think about it in those ways, to working class communities, these particular agendas have been especially um, capable and astute at playing on notions on and ideas of fear around the questions of refugees and migrants, immigration, and especially around the question of Islam. Okay. If I may yeah. just add one, one point and yeah. one uh, thing, uh, if Marine Le Pen should win this election, and right. it could happen, then we would have to face something like a Frexit, uh, France, uh, France right, leaving yeah. the European Union, and that would not only change the, the political situation in France, but also the future of the European Union as a whole. Okay, I want to talk about that in a moment. I also want to get the view from Austria, but first we're going to have to take a break, more of our conversation about populism in Europe and the future of the European Union right after that. Stay with us, you're watching The Heat. Welcome back to The Heat. The decision by Britain to leave the European Union and the rejection of Italy's referendum has brought a significant boost to populist forces across Europe. Key elections next year in France, Germany and the Netherlands could also impact the future of the European Union. Let's get back to our panel. Before we get back to the future of the European Union, uh, Reinhardt, Austria's Freedom Party has warned of what it called the Islamization of Europe and warned of a coming civil war. Uh, on the continent. What can you tell us about this party and is it this anti-immigrant sentiment that's driving these sentiments? It certainly is an anti-immigrant sentiment but what I think we need to uh, mention when we talk about populist parties is populist parties are inherently opportunistic. They change and they ad adjust. In, in, in comparison to a dogmatic party which has sort of clings to its principle, populist parties have an understanding for the flavor of the month and, and adjust. The Freedom Party used to be uh, the first Austrian party to demand Austria's membership in the European Union and had a rather different agenda because something else was popular, but now they know um, they used to be an anti-clerical party, now they style themselves as defender of Christendom and, and Christianity and uh, close to the Catholic Church. So they have a good sense of what is popular, what sells, and, and adjusting. They're like a chameleon, as, as Paul Taggart said, a scholar of populism. And I think um, that's one of the dangers, and I uh, completely agree with Dominic before, that um, we've seen a breakdown of um, left and right, and uh, we've seen and this is a crisis of legitimacy of established parties. But I think we also need to talk about the established parties and, and what they have not done in how they've sort of not, forgotten how to talk to people, how to rally them. And this is one of the issues I think that all the established European parties are facing at this time. Okay, let's get to the future of the uh, European Union. Uh, Paolo, let's take a listen to what the European Union Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker uh, had to say about current political trends in Europe. Let's watch. Those who do think the time has come to deconstruct, to put Europe in pieces, to subdivide us in national divisions are totally wrong. We won't exist as single nations without the European Union. So to what extent are all these things that are happening in Europe right now an indication that the European project might be failing? Um. Well, there are a lot of people think to think, and they, they jump to the obvious conclusion that the European project is, uh, is, uh, is going to fail. Actually, we can also look at it from the other point of view, which is all these trends perhaps uh, and hopefully will give uh, more force to the European project to reconsider exactly as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Juncker said uh, in, in, in the bits you just transmitted and um, broadcasted, um, that to really rethink of the whole project and make it more 
uh, flexible and more adaptable and uh, uh, for the current situation in Europe. And uh, in March next year, we will celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, which uh, established the European Union as we know it. And, and that will really provide an opportunity to think about the next, uh, I'm going to say 60 years, but at least the next decade. Dominic, does the European Union have to, I guess, adapt, retool, reconfigure in some way? Because if we look at what's happened in Britain, which is pulled out, uh, what the talk is of in, in France, these are countries talking about getting out of it completely. Absolutely, and we keep adding on the, you know, Brexit, Nexit, Frexit, and Chexit. I mean, the list sort of goes on. I think that what's, you know, important to, to, to remind ourselves is what is the European Union? Uh, the European Union is a family of nations brought together for peace and prosperity. And one of the things the European Union has not been doing uh, a very good job of is partially because it has suffered recently a serious punch with Brexit, not yet a knockout punch, but there are indications that, it's, that it is wilting, is I don't think it's done enough. And I say this speaking from a, a city like Berlin, where these questions are um, incredibly uh, important uh, historically, is that the European Union needs to do a better job of explaining what it does and of defending this vision world which is absolutely at odds with the vision of these populist parties. The European Union has the potential to be an open, tolerant and multicultural space and what we're hearing from these populist parties is that it should be that the world should move towards a kind of walled up place uh, fighting against globalization, fostering intolerance, protectionism, nationalism and, uh, and so on. And I think that when the European Union starts to speak a little bit more about these kinds of questions it will do a better job and have more chance of defending what it stands for. Having a referendum on the Italian constitution is an opportunity to get rid of a sitting prime minister. I think that if that vote had been on the European Union, the outcome could have been quite different and the same thing would have applied to, uh, to Austria. I still believe that most Europeans believe that the European Union is a positive entity. It's just that we need to do a better job of explaining what it does and how it helps people. Thanks, Claire. I'm not so optimistic that it is, it is just a question of explaining and uh, of messaging as, as a uh, reason for being united in Europe. I think, as Paola, Paola said before, um, the European Union must become more flexible, but that means, on the other side, uh, it, it has to become less integrated. I think uh, the European Union did a very good job during the Cold War but then in the beginning of the 90s, it made a mistake when it decided to, to increase the integration on two levels. So the one level was a, a, the, the horizontal level when they decided to get new right. members in the eastern part of uh, Europe. I think that was, um, was very uh, useful and uh, was very important to do. But at the same time, they decided to increase the level of, of vertical integration and that was, uh, was Maastricht a Treaty and later the Lisbon a Treaty and the idea of a constitution for Europe and to do both things at the same time to speed up the, 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 the just the number of, of participants and member states and at the same time to try uh, to, to deepen the integration. That was a mistake and uh, I think Europe has to try to focus. I think it's important to have those Eastern uh, countries, Eastern European countries within the European Union, but then we have to decide, okay, g give them a little bit more freedom, a little bit more of sovereignty and many people in Europe today think Euro the, the, the national states, and they are very old national states as you know, are going to lose their sovereignty and I think that's more important than uh, saying uh, we have to, to speak out louder about the message and about the, the reasons for the European Union. Well if I could just add, yeah, I, I, look I'm not sure we, you know, we really disagree here. I think that if anything 
the further expansion of Europe and the consolidation of, its, of working with countries to the east is going to become all the more important, particularly when one looks at the ways in which um, President-elect Trump um, seems to view the world in bilateral terms. Um, <clears throat> the uh, interest in, uh, in the Soviet Federation, uh, the ways in which um, the United States is going to move with, uh, uh, with foreign policy means that certain countries in the east of Europe, particularly around NATO and so on are going to be increasingly vulnerable and it's going to be incredibly important for the European Union to come together and to express forcefully um, the importance of adherence for these particular countries and to think about what it, this means for places like Lithuania, Latvia right. and also down the road for countries <coughs> like, uh, like Ukraine. Okay. Rana, uh, you talked earlier on about uh, the uh, Donald Trump election victory here in the United States. What kind of inspiration does that offer to similar kind of movements in Europe? And, you know, Trump hasn't even taken office yet. He takes office in January, well, next month. Uh, is it going to get stronger for these movements in Europe? We've got four years to go here. <laughs> That remains to be seen. I think that's one of the interesting questions. But I think we continue to talk about Europe. I think we see populism on the rise from the Philippines to the United States. It's not just a question of, of, of Europe and European elites and what the European Union can and cannot do. Um, it was interesting that uh, initially the Freedom Party in Austria welcomed Brexit and welcomed uh, Donald Trump, but after the uh, sort of negative press coverage, they sort of took a step back and tried to de-emphasize their Euroscepticism. In fact, now the European, the Freedom Party is now clear whether it wants to break with the European Union or not. So it, it, we have to we have to watch and see. I think uh, if the uh, perception of Donald Trump will be that he um, makes uh, makes life more risky, I think it's, it would backfire. But if, if, on the other hand, it's seen as a, as a liberation, a, a sweeping change, it will be uh, everything will be made new, t taking the country back to some idealized past, and if they're able to communicate this, I think it will have a positive effect. I mean, I know that the Austrian Freedom Party has studied the Trump uh, campaign very closely. They've paid very close attention. And uh, populist parties in Europe learn from each other and study each other. So this is sort of one of the important questions. Certainly going to have an impact, but uh, it could also have a negative impact. And I think the Austrian election has shown that it did have a negative impact because right now the perception is sort of the risk has gone up rather than gone down. And to some extent, people are risk averse. Um, however, I think Ultimately, these parties are a, challenges, a challenge to liberal democracy, a particular version of democracy, not democracy per se, but sort of our Western understanding of a liberal democracy. And I think that is what is at stake. Okay, and we're going to have to end it there. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.